Hello and welcome back to the ROI podcast, the podcast that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I've done yet another different blazer because we have the special guest, a returning guest, Mr. Rick Rule. Rick, uh, thank you for joining me again. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing? My pleasure, sir. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Pleased to hear it. Uh, Rick, from what I'm seeing at the moment, at least, it sounds like we're doing a little better than the uh, poor folks at the Fed. On October the 13th, uh, it looks like about 18% of the US uh, T-bonds had to be bought up by prime dealers, suggesting to me that perhaps some of the demand from other sovereign wealth funds or whoever is not uh, quite what it used to be. You are, and uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but you've said in the past, I am at heart a used money salesman, a credit, a credit analyst, a banker. How would Rick Rule, the credit analyst, analyze the current uh, credit score of the uh, U.S. government? I think the U.S. government and the U.S. dollar uh, are evidence of uh, an increasingly unattractive debtor. Uh, I will say, however, to paraphrase my good friend Doug Casey, that the U.S. dollar is, as usual, the prettiest mare at the slaughterhouse uh, when I think about the weakness exhibited by the U.S. as a debtor, uh, I'm horrified as an American. Uh, and when I compare it to other sovereign jurisdictions, <laughs> I, I find it less bad. Now, the prettiest mare at the slaughterhouse is not meant to be praise, uh, certainly. I, I think the thing that holds the market for U.S. treasuries together is simply the lack of a viable alternative. Uh, the U.S. market is easily the most transparent uh, and liquid financial market on the planet. And if you look at the U.S. government's federal balance sheet and you confine your observation to on-balance sheet liabilities, uh, which is to say the parapasu liability that the government has to you and other holders of federal government securities, which is to say $33 trillion in go gross obligations $22 or $23 trillion in net obligations, uh, relative to U.S. government tax receipts, you don't feel too bad. When, however, you juxtapose that uh, with a federal deficit in, in terms of its ongoing obligations that exceeds $1.7 trillion, but probably more worrying to me, when you juxtapose it to the net present value of off-balance sheet liabilities, which is to say entitlements, social, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, military pensions, unfunded US government pensions, then the circumstance becomes much more worrying. But more, maybe not more worrying, but as worrying to me, when I look at the value proposition offered up by the long-term U.S. Treasury obligations, they don't seem to be really attractive instruments, even viewed from uh, the prism of a healthy debtor, in the sense that, as we've discussed on your show before, Benjamin, um, I don't think that the CPI is a relevant gauge of the deterioration of the purchasing power of U.S. dollars particularly because the gauge is a pre-tax gauge, not an after-tax gauge. I personally believe, and I'm not going to go way on the limb like the shadow stats people, I personally believe that the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar uh, approaches, if not exceeds, 7%. The prospect of getting paid 5 in a currency which is depreciating at 7 means that as an example for the U.S. 10-year Treasury, the U.S. government solemnly squares that they will decrease my wealth by 2% a year compounded for 10 years, a promise which I find disquieting, but a promise which I believe that they will keep. <laughs> so I don't like the credit quality except relative to all the others, and I don't like the yield. Uh, that means it's a fairly hard credit for me to buy. I need to say uh, I am way long. Uh, the sixth month, uh, I'm willing to lose 2% in the very short term to maintain U.S. dollar liquidity, which I'm afraid I'll find handy <laughs> at some point in time. 
but I wouldn't own the tenure. Uh, I mean, it's just very difficult for me to think of a circumstance where I would own the tenure with this value proposition. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. And when you compare the CPI to uh, the Big Mac index, uh, you, you start to get a, an, an indication as to the real rate of inflation. I'm welcoming. I need, in... a, I need a better index, by the way, than the Big Mac index, too. Uh, people like rules of thumb. I like to add back the components of my own cost of living when the Fed doesn't include, include food or fuel. I mean, how does that work for me? Right. I fly, I eat. Uh, and when they don't add tax, uh, as I've told you before, if I didn't have to pay the tax, I wouldn't bitch quite so much about the index, but it makes the index irrelevant. Uh, well, Paul Krugman was uh, celebrating very early uh, last week. Apparently, we've we've won the war against inflation as long as you exclude, as you mentioned, food, yeah. fuel, and, and shelter and basically everything else. So it was really rather... Rather comical. I'm welcoming welcoming in my co-pilot, Daryl Thomas. Uh, how are you, DT? I feel much better now. I was flying blind before, but uh, now I got my wingman. I've uh, I've got my mojo back. Yeah, yeah, doing doing good. Uh, you know, just jumping straight into the into the action. But um, I'm excited to to be here. Appreciate you coming back on, Rick, and engaging with us. Like I said, it feels like family. Uh, I do have a question. Like Sue, so just jumping straight in. Um, Jump in, brother. I was uh, so there's a recent article that came out, Rick, and it was uh, about uh, the United States, and this is just in terms of like you talking about, uh, you know, government debt deficits, you know, um, the purchasing power, uh, and so the the U.S. government, uh, well, the U.S. as a country got a C plus grade on the best places uh, to retirement or retirement. Uh, systems and so uh, and I was looking at the the top places for uh, the global pension index. I think it says Netherlands is first, uh, Iceland second, Denmark third. They got Israel at fourth. I don't know, you know, what that looks like with the Hamas situation or whatnot. If that's still <laughs> if that's still there, but Australia is at number five, and the U.S. isn't even in the top um, in in the top uh, ten, and so. Uh, what does this look like for people with, um, you know, in terms of retirement, obviously social security is underfunded. Uh, we're like hundred, you know, I think a hundred trillion underfunded or something like that. So what does this look like for even retirement, you know, with inflation and, and such? Well, I, I don't think there's a one size fits all, Daryl. And we've had that discussion before too. Uh, you know, these indexes published by the popular magazines uh, pretend that every person's vision of retirement is the same. But my own vision of retirement, as you know, is to recoil with horror at the prospect of it. Um, I am concerned when the indexers talk about places like Iceland and Denmark, that they don't take into account the solvency of the retirement system. I mean, interestingly for myself, if I were going to retire, I've made provisions for my own retirement. Uh, and if Social Security doesn't pay me a dime, although I'll be angry about what I put in, uh, it won't change my decision as to what to have for breakfast on the way out. My, uh, I, I mean, personally, I, I would likely, were I to retire, to retire to someplace like Argentina uh, and get paid U.S. dollars and spend Argentine pesos. That advice isn't useful for most of your subscribers because they don't have the opportunity to live life as I have. The message, particularly for my younger younger viewers, people your age, Daryl, uh, is to understand that I have already spent your retirement. My generation voted themselves all kinds of cool benefits, you know, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all this really nice stuff. We make a lot as baby boomers about the fact that we have $140 trillion in inherited wealth. Well, that's interesting because we're handing you off $140 trillion in recourse and off-balance sheet liabilities, which is a different way of saying we're leaving you nothing. Uh, you are going to need to be responsible for your own retirement to the extent that people your age are irrespective of where they live in the world uh, going to enjoy retirement. Uh, that's really a function of their own preparedness. Now, uh, with regards to Benjamin living in Australia, the superannuation uh, scheme, which is in effect what in our country would be a, a sole risk 
um, you know, 401k, uh, that's a different circumstance. Chile has done the same thing. They privatized their social security scheme 40 years ago, and they allow, they allow people within broad uh, framework to manage their own retirement. It's not commingled uh, with the retirements of the lame, the halt, and the blind, uh, like it is in the United States. But were I your age, I'd be extremely concerned. Uh, not concerned enough that I was frozen into inaction, but rather con concerned enough that I was uh, forced to action. Very well said. With this current state of the, the balance sheet, let's call it, of the US sovereign, it seems fairly clear they're going to have to engage in uh, um, financial repression in order to decrease the net present value of those uh, future liabilities, leading to more and more inflation. Uh, with this setup, at least as far as I can see, uh, is really just le leading, uh, leading us down the garden path of more and more inflation. How do financial services and banks fit into your portfolio as you look out the window into the future, Rick? It seems like a juxtaposition at first between natural resources on the one side and then let's call it more financial-based uh, services and banking on the other. How do you go about setting up a portfolio and um, and finding the blend between the two? Well, I do precisely that, uh, not because of the, go the government, ironically, uh, but because of my own limitations. Uh, I understand conventional financial services, and I understand natural resources. I, I maintain that despite as, despite the perniciousness of government, that the biggest investment risk that I face is to the left of my right ear and to the right of my left ear. And I have found that to the extent that I pay attention to businesses that I understand, I do well. And when I get, get outside of my uh, area of expertise, I tend to get spanked, uh, which I don't enjoy. Uh, the banking business, irrespective of the climate, is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful business if you don't make mistakes. To the extent that you make money off the spreads between the price you pay your depositors for their savings uh, and the vigorish, the interest that you're allowed to receive from your borrowers when you lend, uh, it, it's truly uh, a spectacular business if you don't make some of the common mistakes. What are the common mistakes? Well, first of all, treating your depositors poorly. Uh, beating up on your customers is not something that guarantees the long-term success of your business. Money actually ultimately will go to its where well, it's well treated, which is why you know our last bank, uh, Everbank, did so well. We simply treated our depositors well, <laughs> and hence they came to us. Uh, equally importantly, too many banks try to be all things to all people. The idea that a bank can understand 100 or 200 different industries well enough to understand collateral values and analyze cash flows is a non-starter. It can't be done. You have to focus on industries as a lender where you know your borrowers, preferably personally. You know their businesses. You know their industries. You know the collateral values, and you are able to understand their financial projections. Uh, in my life, uh, that has mostly involved lending against natural resources and precious metals, businesses I grew up in. Another common mistake uh, in banking is the time spread. Long-term interest rates are often higher than short-term interest rates. So the inclination of bankers who haven't read any history uh, is to borrow short, which is keep the deposit window short so they're minimizing interest rates while keeping the lending window long. Having short term floating rate deposits, uh, which is to say liabilities, and long-term fixed rate assets in a rising interest rate, a rising inflation retirement, is what brought down the savings and loan industry. <laughs> it's what res was responsible for the financial panic of 1910. Uh, it brought down Silicon Valley Bank. It brought down First Republic Bank. And bankers do it again and again and again and again. There is no requirement that bankers be inherently stupid. And there are a lot of community bankers in this country uh, and some big bankers who don't make this fundamental mistake, although uh, it's very tempting. I would say the third principal mistake that banks make, which is idiotic, 
is that they're very often undercapitalized. Uh, the U.S. Fed says that a 7% equity slice is, quote, well capitalized. Uh, I prefer 10. Uh, the idea that you have a dime of equity uh, in front of every dollar of deposits, I think is good business for the depositor, for the institution, and ultimately for the borrower. The borrower wants to borrow from a solvent entity that can maintain their access to funding. Uh, what you find in banking is that everything is okay until it isn't. Uh, and when it isn't, uh, banks, <laughs> it sounds trite, but banks need to have cash. Uh, you find the extraordinarily well-run banks, uh, banks like Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach would be an example, expand their balance sheet when other banks are contracting their balance sheet. As I recall, before the 2008 liquidity panic, Farmers and Merchants Bank had uh, equity as 23 or 24%. Uh, of total assets, meaning that almost one dollar and four, uh, one dollar and five, pardon me, uh, was equity. As other banks had to scale back, Farmers and Merchants Bank went into the market and stole their customers. They ran down uh, their equity because of opportunity from twenty three or twenty four percent uh, of uh, assets all the way down to fourteen meaning that they paid up a little bit for deposits, that they increased the size of their balance sheet, and they went and stole billions of dollars of business from their competitors. As the world reliquified <laughs> uh, and the other banks became more aggressive, Farmers and Merchants Bank moderated their balance sheet and increased the percentage of equity. That's the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> I find it's seldom it the way the banks do. I find it's a lot like uh, Nassim Taleb's turkey analogy that everything is, uh, it's inherently a fragile business the way it's run because you have such a, a skinny liquidity. And don't you find it amusing that the, the bankers are allowed to hold, say, 7% uh, equity backing, yet the customers to whom they loan, they usually require at least 10, if not 20% as a, uh, as a deposit? Uh, that's perfectly understandable and perfectly self-serving. The bank is concerned about their solvency, not the customer's solvency. Uh, I, I mean, I understand it completely. Uh, what I understand less is uh, when bankers begin to believe that they and their borrowers are smart enough that they can suspend their lending covenants. The, you know, the bad news about lending is that one really bad loan undoes all the good that you did with 12 good loans. It's not a forgiving business if you get careless, uh, if you get stupid. It's a business where you get rich, really, truly rich by not making mistakes, but you got to not make big mistakes. You have to understand your borrowers. You have to maintain loan covenants. If you miss a loan, because the borrower won't agree to prudent covenants, uh, be grateful at the end of the day. Maybe have a glass of champagne, celebrating the fact that you missed a loan that could threaten your institution uh, in the longer term. And whatever you do as a banker or as a bank shareholder, <laughs> do not <laughs> borrow short and lend long, uh, which is a really, really, really common mistake. That bankers make. There's no requirement that you be stupid. <laughs> there really isn't. Uh, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't regard myself as anything close to the best businessman I ever met. Um, mercifully, in banking, uh, I haven't made too many catastrophic mistakes. Uh, I can't say that about some other businesses I dabbled in. <laughs> but in terms of banking, I haven't made any catastrophic mistakes. And there's no requirement that you do it. It's a very good business. Look, I mean, look at the spreads now. You are paying depositors, if you're in the top quartile of U.S. interest rate players, about 4.3%. Uh, and you are uh, lending money out. I mean, even if you're lending it to the U.S. government, uh, you're lending it at five, which is to say you have a 75 basis point riskless spread. But 
that most banks aren't doing that. You are lending money that you borrowed at four and three quarters at some number like seven and a half or eight. So you're generating a 250 basis point lending spread uh, with a 10% equity slice. This is one of the few businesses in the world, as Warren Buffett has pointed out, that if you don't make mistakes, you can earn 15% uh, return on equity after tax uh, and reinvest the money at the same multiple, and you can do it for 10 years. There's no business that compounds capital as well as a well-run commercial bank. Notice, however, I said well-run. Indeed, I did. That was a fascinating insight from one side of the, the banking table. From the other, as a potential investor looking in, what scares me is, I mean, this is an industry that has two separate uh, uh, rules of accounting. I mean, you've got your hold to, your hold to maturity and your mark to market. How yep. do I, as the investor, how do I protect myself against there being some left tail risk, some hidden nasty on the balance sheet uh, when you, you're using these two different rules of accounting? Uh, the bank is required to give you something called a statement of financial condition. Uh, and in the statement of financial, by the way, they don't like giving this, <laughs> but they're required, at least in the US, to give you a statement of financial condition. And the statement of financial condition will talk about the breakdown on the asset side of the balance sheet, uh, which are uh, allegedly to be held to maturity and which are to be uh, marked to market. Uh, and if you probe, there are numerous services, including Weiss, uh, which will uh, mark to market for you the held to maturity assets of the bank. It was widely reported a couple of months ago that if you took Bank of America's held to maturity market and you marked it to market, that they were insolvent. Now, they're not going to be forced to do that, uh, but it's important as an investor that you pay attention. There are some other tricks, though, that from my point of view work better. Unfortunately, you have to work to ascertain them. My favorite trick is looking back at the last, say, 10 years of income statements uh, and balance sheets and look for banks that have consistently over-reserved for bad debts. What that means is that the bank is profitable enough that it's using the reserve as a tax shelter. <laughs> They're deliberately understating earnings so that they minimize their tax. By the way, Warren Buffett does this in Berkshire Hathaway too. When you look at uh, Warren Buffett's uh, reinsurance for reinsurance reserves, that's what he calls his float. Uh, what you'll find is that his policy acquisition costs and his reserves for claims exceed by a substantial margin <laughs> every year his write downs and his expenses. What that means is that he is building float and minimizing tax at the expense of, rec of reported earnings. When you find a company that is comfortable enough with their earnings profile that they will manage their earnings down <laughs> uh, in order to save on cash taxes paid, uh, you have found a very, very, very good business. I like it. Daryl, anything to add before I move on to the next topic? Uh, no, uh, Rick, that was, that was really good. Um, I was kind of wondering, I, I was, I was kind of wondering about a few things with, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, back in March when we had the, uh, the banking crisis, um, and you and I had talked and you mentioned that it was overblown, uh, potentially overblown, um, are a lot of banks like on their balance sheets, are they still holding like um, debt that's paying, you know, government debt that's uh, paying, you know, uh, less than 1% interest. And, um, and uh, cause I mean, right now with the higher interest rates, they're able to get a higher interest on, on the money that they loan to the government, but then they're also getting, I mean, banks that do mortgages and stuff, they're also getting a higher interest rate there as well. Um, have you have you looked I, I think, much into that? I think the sin that you'll see on bank balance sheets with regards to government obligations uh, would be government-sponsored collateralized mortgage obligations. I, I think there's probably a lot of sin uh, out there in long-dated CMOs, but I think a bigger problem is probably long-dated fixed-rate uh, commercial real estate first mortgages. 
uh, not too long ago, I was in New York City and I went to a second class, you know, second tier office building, um, Midtown, uh, that was 15% occupied. <laughs> now, some lender has a mortgage on that. Uh, this building doesn't have enough operating revenue being 15% occupied to fund the operating cost of the building, never mind service the debt. And if you combine that with the fact that the commercial mortgage here is probably a 10-year mortgage or 15-year mortgage, taken out at rates that were fixed at lower than current rates, uh, you have an absolute unexploded bomb. And I suspect that this is continued, uh, you know, throughout the length and breadth of much of the U.S. banking industry. But one of the things that I've always done in banking, uh, listen, we've written a lot of mortgages in my time. 30-year fixed mortgages, and we hold them for three interest payments by the borrower. In other words, we, in other words, we season them, and then we sell them <laughs> right away. I, I have absolutely no interest in having a, a long-dated fixed-term asset on the balance sheet, particularly one that's funded with short-term liabilities to me. There's a great business in mortgages, but mortgages shouldn't be held uh, in institutions other than, say, pension funds, endowment funds, uh, insurance companies, companies that have very, very, very long-term stable sources of capital and very, very long-term stable obligations. These shouldn't be held by institutions who are funding a 30-year fixed rate uh, 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 asset uh, with an overnight floating rate liability. That's just stupid. So uh, you, I, I got to touch on this. You said an unexploded bomb, right? Yep. Uh, with the uh, the uh, the mortgages from uh, which call it uh, corporations and uh, C commercial real estate. I'm thinking office buildings, estate. I'm, I'm shopping centers, time. all yeah, this yeah. kind of stuff that everybody and their brother wanted to finance eight years ago, nine years ago. Uh, there was an extremely competitive market in commercial real estate mortgages because people had enjoyed. A, a very good business financing them for 40 years through through declining interest rates uh, and increasingly uh, generous cap rates. Uh, the world has changed <laughs> and we're going to have to work our way through that. We're going to have to have a hangover. We're going to have to have a long workout. There are lots and lots and lots of well-run community banks in the United States. Um, I keep pointing to Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach, but it's you know, there are dozens of them in the United States that wouldn't have considered a long-term fixed rate obligation. They wouldn't have considered a covenant light loan, <laughs> uh, so-called liar loan. Uh, that's just not the business that they're in. And when I said that the crisis was overblown, uh, what I meant was that for most Americans, having access to a well-run bank, even a well-run bank in their community, was something that they needn't worry about. Uh, that isn't to say that we aren't, as a society, going to have a hangover as a consequence of the banking crisis. We are going to have to be involved in pricing, in providing below market liquidity to the biggest banks in the country for a decade to undo the harm that they've done themselves uh, over the last 10 years. This is going to happen. Is J.P. Morgan Chase going to go broke? No. Is Citicorp going to go broke? No. Is Wells going to go broke? No. Is Bank of America going to broke? Go broke? No. Because <laughs> you're going to pay for it. It's going to be on the installment plan, and unless you pay attention, you're not going to feel it. But you're going to pay for it. Yeah, too too big to fail. That's right. That's too right. big to jail too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of valuing uh, a, the stock of a, a banking business, a publicly listed bank, um, what does Rick like to use in terms of his valuation models? Are you looking at book value as a, a multiple to book value? Uh, difficult to use a free cash flow yield. Are you looking at trailing 12 month dividends? Uh, and how do you avoid a value trap uh, when using those, those types of metrics? Uh, I court value traps. 
because I think in five-year terms. Uh, what happens when a bank performs as a business but underperforms as a stock? It gets taken over. <laughs> That's what happens. Either the market recognizes the superiority of the bank and the stock goes up, or a competitor with a lower cost of capital takes them over. That's what happens. They only unwind two ways. I take a look at book, but book is very illusory. Uh, I don't like, as I've told you before, rules of thumb. I personally avoid banks that have derivatives on the balance sheet, except to manage interest rate risks. Uh, a bank where, you know, 3% of equity, 4% of equity, is involved in the notional value of a derivative, which is an interest rate derivative, so that the bank is managing the spread between the interest rates on the liabilities uh, and the interest rates on the assets, that's fine. But a bank like uh, J.P. Morgan Chase or Citicorp or Goldman Sachs, where there are 30 trillion or $40 trillion of derivatives supported by a bank balance sheet that's in the 250 or $300 billion range, is something that I don't understand. There may or may not be sin there, uh, but I don't understand enough about it to own a bank like that. The idea that you could sustain uh, that type of derivatives exposure uh, with equity at less than 1% of assets under management, when the equity is meant to stand uh, the depositors in good stead, is something that I don't get. Uh, they say that $30 trillion is the aggregate liability, that the notional liability is much, much, much smaller because there's counterparties. But that assumes that the counterparties pay. And having a 1% equity slice, uh, to me, it isn't sufficient to stand the risk uh, in an asset and a liability that I don't understand. Uh, what I like to look at is not one year trailing, but rather 10 year trailing. I want to see banks that have served a market well. I want to see banks where their aggregate deposit cost, uh, the interest expense around the deposit cost, not the non-interest expense, but the interest rates around the deposit co to cost is in the top quartile in the country, not the bottom quartile in the country. I want to see a bank whose funding requirements don't include chiseling their customers. Uh, when I go into my big box bank, uh, there are at last count 16 deposit products, five of which don't want to pay me any interest. Now, you can imagine how interested I am in funding a bank that doesn't want to pay me interest. Maybe I'm a more informed consumer, but I operate under the theory that in the next 10 years, all consumers are going to be informed. And so I don't believe that that funding model, cheating your customers, is a sustaining funding model. And I uh, also want to see a bank looking back 10 years that at least adequately reserved uh, for unexploded bombs in their portfolio. I don't want to see a year where the realization of unexploded bombs exceeded their prior five years reserves. <laughs> uh what that really means is that they overreported their earnings. And I want to see a bank that's in the best quartile nationwide in non-interest expense. Too often, banks become salary machines, uh, compensation machines. And I really believe that the United States in particular, but Australia too, is substantially overbranched. Uh, I, I look at the branches as a cost center. I go into my branch here, run by a very, very, very nice woman. I'm certain if I asked her, she'd make me tea. I mean, she's just a really, really, really nice woman. And she doesn't know very much about banking. When I ask her questions about her deposit products and her loan products, she points me to a service phone. Now, I could do that from home, uh, but the branch banking network typically adds 125 to 135 basis points of the total cost to operating a bank. <laughs> um, I look at banks that have very low sustained non-interest expense as being superior banks. Remember that you make your money on the spread between what you pay your borrowers and 
pardon, pardon, what, what you pay your depositors and what you charge your lenders. And the more money it costs you to do that, the less money that's left over <laughs> as return on equity. It, it, it's very important to measure trends in non-interest expense. Interesting. So there may be some room for streamlining the expense column. Uh, I, I want to come back to this idea of the value trap. My next question was how to identify it and how to avoid it. But here you are saying that you actually caught these quote unquote value traps. How do you I, define a value trap in that case? Uh, a company that is a superior company by most metrics where the share price doesn't go up. Uh, a company that bores investors. I've made a lot of money in my life by having a five or six year time frame rather than a three month time frame. <laughs> there was a time in my life interesting when I was interestingly when I was young, when I had lots of time left on earth, where I had no patience. Uh, now I'm an old guy and I have increasingly few five year periods left. But it's wild that while I have less time on earth, experience has made me more patient. And uh, when people say to me, you know, when I'm talking about something that I say is a good company, uh, Rick, why did the stock go down? I have to look at them, smirk a little bit and say, a complicated question. I suspect more sellers than buyers. Why do you think? Uh, and when you question the sellers or the buyers and you ask them about the methodology to make the decision, uh, it usually comes down to got a hunch, bunch. bet a bunch. Uh, that's not sufficient. I, I really, really, really like competing with people who don't show up against me. And the idea that I can buy a solvent, well-run business with durable competitive advantages after I've already done the work at the same or better yet, a declining cost of entry, which is to say a falling share price, where the share price is falling, but the fortunes of the business are increasing, that's classically referred to as a value trap. Uh, it's referred to by old men who are loss averse <laughs> as an investment opportunity. Yeah, perhaps they can uh, engage in some of that hold to maturity uh, type thinking as opposed to just looking at what their their stock has been marked to market. But unfortunately, yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely. For me, the mark to market tells me that I either buy something or I sell it. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I had an idea, I had a premise about a stock uh, and a falling share price has proven to me that my premise was wrong. Uh, that's useful information too. You have to revisit your premise. Uh, you know, I've told your audience before the wonderful Paladin story where I bought some stock at 10 cents, it fell to a penny. If you have a 90% loss in a stock, you don't have a hold. You have a buy or you have a sell. It's that simple. You have to revisit your premise. When the price of, when the price of Paladin went from a penny to 25 or 30 cents, when you have a 30 bagger, you don't have a hold either. <laughs> uh, although uh, I, I held most of it. But at, at some point in time, you have to sell enough uh, in a risky position to take your money off the table. There are other circumstances in my life. Again, I revisit to Farmers and Merchants Bank of uh, Long Beach or even Berkshire Hathaway, where it, it's very difficult for me to sell because I think, how would I replace it in my portfolio? What would I do with the money? Buffett famously says the biggest risk of selling is that you do something stupid with money that was already smart. Um, and I've certainly found that to be true. Sadly, so have I in, a, in personal experience. If speaking of Mr. Buffett, uh, one of his most famous investments was in Visa. Um, strikes You've just done a, a royalty boot camp. Strikes me as almost like a royalty type business uh, in that it can be an inflation beneficiary. Yep. How do you see... Um, these credit card processing and fintech companies uh, performing into the future with the disruption risk of, uh, how do I say this without my account getting flagged, uh, CBDCs, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think if, uh, if we are to be plagued with mandatory CBDCs in the future, that it will be fairly far in the future. Uh, my criticism of Visa is simply that it looks to me like I pay too much for the operating earnings. Uh, Visa is a wonderful business. Uh, it truly is a wonderful business. And you're wise to describe it as a royalty business. It's a royalty on a network. Uh, it, it, it's almost a payments ecosystem. Uh, in fact, when people talk about the payments industry, sometimes they don't talk about the industry. They 
paraphrase it as visa, <laughs> which is the way the copying industry used to refer to Xerox. It's a very, very, very nice, in, very nice industry. And, and Visa works for at least a couple of its customers. Uh, it works in a very gross sense for the banks who finance credit cards. Uh, right now, the median credit card interest rate, as I understand it, in the United States is 22%. People are terrified about the credit card business because they're experiencing 6.5% defaults. Uh, six and a half percent default in a 22 percent world <laughs> is not an unattractive proposition, uh, particularly when you're getting a, a little bit of the payment stream from Visa back uh, on the um, merchant discount. So it's it's a truly wonderful business. It's a service business where Visa interposes themselves between each of the customer, the funder and the merchant and takes a little vig from each. Uh, and they've built such an amazing network that it's a, a very, very, very sticky business. Is there a, a risk in the long term? Yes. But I think other businesses probably experience greater disruption. It's also true that central bank digital currencies don't need to make Visa obsolete. If the central bank digital currencies remain mediums of exchange, uh, it could be that the central bank digital currency, the digital dollar, if you will, will simply be a substitute for the real dollar and nothing will change with Visa except for that the medium of exchange coursing through its veins will change. Interesting. And with a, a similar type business uh, invested by um, Berkshire, there's a company uh, which I own called Stoneco uh, looking to be a fintech slash bank slash commercial lender in Brazil, uh, which has a humongous runway of people becoming digitalized uh, and into the banking system. Many people in Brazil uh, are just getting mobile phones, getting uh, bank accounts uh, for the first time. Does a business like that uh, pique your interest in terms of it has the qualities um, of the business model in, let's say, a less saturated market? It fascinates me, and I never let myself play it. Um, I, I want businesses that I understand better than my competitors understand them. Uh, and I want to understand the durable competitive advantage. When I look at Berkshire Hathaway, I have dur two durable competitive advantage. Well, maybe not durable now. I have Warren Buffett, who at 92, I guess you could argue uh, in terms of the future, isn't durable. Uh, <laughs> you know, even Methuselah passed on at one point in time. But I have a guy in terms of general market securities who's the best stock picker I've ever seen. Certainly way better than me in a wide variety of industries. But importantly, I have Buffett in a reinsurance wrapper. Uh, which means two things. One, it means that he gets a return on capital employed on money that is e neither debt nor equity. It's float. <laughs> I mean, this is absolutely miraculous what that does in terms of return on equity. But more importantly, literally more importantly than the float, is he gets to manage his tax. Uh, if Buffett writes a long-term reinsurance contract, a 15-year reinsurance contract, irrespective of how well secured it is today, he gets to make an arbitrary judgment uh, as to what his reserve should be on it. And he doesn't have to pay that reserve. He takes it out of earnings and puts it into something called float. But what that means is that historically, Berkshire Hathaway as a group has paid something like 11% uh, of normalized earnings by way of tax. So he takes operating earnings as an example from C's Candy or the Burlington Northern Railroad, takes it upstream, uses it to uh, establish loss reserves on 15 year long policies at General Re uh, and shelters the current earnings from Burlington Northern for six, seven or 10 years. Uh, the insurance regulators think this is a good idea, as do I, by the way, because the insurance regulators want solvent insurance companies. <laughs> and Berkshire Hathaway is as solvent uh, as they come. Uh, but the idea that I get the best stock picker in human history and I get him in an after-tax wrapper, <laughs> you know, I thought, could I compete with Buffett? No, 
Uh, and could I compete with Buffett when I pay uh, normal rates and he pays 11? Even less likely. Uh, I, I tell you that to differentiate my understanding of Berkshire Hathaway from most people's understanding of Stone. You don't have 40 or 45 years of experience to understand the durable competitive advantages built into Berkshire Hathaway with regards to its reinsurance structure or its product mix. Very interesting. But I'm not I'll... arguing about the future, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to get too much into subjects that I won't be around to understand. Yeah, well, Yogi Berra does say that uh, predictions are difficult, particularly when they're about right. the future. Uh, I've proven that. <laughs> DT, anything to add before we start uh, throwing some names uh, to Rick for some commentary? Uh, no, not nothing to add right now. I'm just, I'm just soaking it all in, you know, soaking it in. Yeah, eleven percent of reported earnings, uh, DT. I'll be testing you on that later. Uh, so let's move on, uh, Rick. You've made mention uh, before that you see a lot of value in the regional banks. Um, can I ask for your opinion and ranking on Pacific Western Bank and Western Alliance banks? Um, I had don't a look know at enough those. about either to comment. Fair enough. Uh, I looked at them and and gave it a pass. Throwing a, a little another boring business that's considered a value trap, uh, the coal business at the moment probably will be forever uh, the way things are politically. You've made mention that you weren't buying coal uh, businesses that were below five billion in market cap. And recently, down here, we had big news. Whitehaven is now the biggest coal player in Australia, uh, yep. taking over these mines that apparently no one wanted. Um, are you buying Whitehaven now that its market cap is there or thereabouts? I'm looking very carefully at Whitehaven. Um, uh, that's an attractive business. Uh, it, it's a group of people that have proven uh, that they can do the political and financial um, upheaval in coal well. Uh, they have thus far been able to manage their funding in an industry where funding is disappearing on the coal side. Uh, what has happened to me is that privately I'm involved in a company that is providing uh, environmental bonding and reclamation for the coal industry. And the obligate the ability for me to add capital uh, to the coal industry uh, in a capacity I understand well, which is ensuring where all the major competitors are leaving the market. <laughs> Uh, at your age, I would have said it was the most fun I could have with my clothes on. Now I'm forced to say at 70, probably just the most fun I can have. But it's a, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's such an ob it's such an opportunity that I can't personally pass on it. I was wondering if you'd been writing some checks in one capacity uh, or another. Speaking of uh, just a hated stock at the moment, uh, switching gears completely, Tamarack Valley uh, in Canada just seems yeah. to be lagging behind everything. No one's got any confidence in this thing. And yet it appears to have quite a lot of talk to higher oil, higher oil prices, which uh, for me uh, are on the way. What are your thoughts on Tamarack Valley? If you want a leverage play on the recovery of the Canadian oil and gas industry uh, or a leveraged play on Trudeau losing the elect election, I guess that's saying the same thing. Uh, I, I think Tamarack Valley is an interesting play. I in my own Canadian portfolio, uh, I've decided that I don't want torque, that I want the highest possible names, like the highest value, the highest quality possible names I can get. I'm playing uh, the Canadian oil scene absolutely from the beta perspective, not from the alpha perspective. I'm not trying to outperform the Canadian market in a rebound. I'm trying to play the outperformance of the entire Canadian market relative to investment opportunities. So I'm going to own names like, you know, Freehold, Arc, Pato, Birchcliff, Tourmaline, um, uh, higher quality names in the here and now. Uh, there are other people, I think, uh, of my former colleague, Eric Nuttall, who are superb uh, at playing torque in the Canadian market, as I was 25 years ago. There's a difference between what a 45-year-old guy does and what a 70-year-old guy does, for good reason. Fair play. DT, uh, any names you want to throw in there before I just continue down my uh, never-ending list? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Rick, I've been looking more into the offshore drilling 
uh, oil companies like Valeris. Um, and then uh, there's there was a couple other that I've been looking into. Do you, do you have any comment on Valeris, V-A-L? I don't. I don't. No comment. No comment. Uh, too bad you didn't ask me last week about Hess. <laughs> too late now. <laughs> yeah, M and A does seem to be uh, does seem to be heating up in the space. Rick, uh, again, it's uh, similar to offshore, but in the tanker market, uh, I've been fascinated with the tanker market recently, and I think that the, a lot of people are sleeping on geopolitical disruptions and what that will do to uh, time charter equivalents. But you've made mention you don't really play in that space. Is that still the case? And if so, why is that? Uh, I know uh, a newsletter writer and I know a money manager in the space who are superb. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to write a fairly substantial check to the money manager. Uh, I am not going at age 70 to refamiliarize myself with a new business. Uh, neither dry bulk, which I like, uh, or tankers, which I like. Uh, what I'm going to do is pay a young guy some management fee to do that for me. As you point out, it's a hated business. Uh, anything to do with hydrocarbons is hated. Uh, and tanker utilization, despite the wishes of the big thinkers, is increasing. Tanker charter rates are so low that nobody's building new tankers. While the existing fleet, uh, you know, is starting to look like me, uh, well past its prime. So you're going to see increasing numbers, particularly of uh, single hold tankers, uh, basically getting turned into scrap metal. Uh, and so you see declining capacity uh, at, at the same time that you're seeing increasing utilization. It's kind of tough to screw that up. Famous, famous last words, but I do happen to agree, particularly around VLCCs. I mean, the order book right. just looks just looks tapped out. Um, yeah, it's years. gone. Yeah. It's absolutely gone, uh, which is wonderful. And it makes sense that it's gone. If you look at the increase in interest rates, what you would have to pay uh, on a project basis to build a boat uh, and what you can obtain today in long-term lease rates, uh, it makes absolute sense that the order books are bare. At the same time, it would appear that the tremendous subsidy that shipbuilders in Japan at least have received is at least temporarily a thing of the past. Uh, so, you know, it used to be that uh, these operating deficits of the shipyards would be made up for by the taxpayers. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be occurring anymore either. Very interesting. Uh, and if you can get the labor with the know-how to, to build these things, uh, Rick, Dry bulk, you mentioned uh, industrial materials, uh, something that I don't have any exposure to. Looking down uh, again in Brazil in terms of Vale, how do you see the environment for industrial materials and what rank would you currently give Vale? I have Vale as a four, uh, which overlooks the potential impact of another four letter word, uh, the guy who runs the country. Uh, <clears throat> he doesn't like Vale, uh, and I think he represents the aspirations of a lot of Brazilians. I suspect that Vale will be successful <laughs> even after he leaves office, uh, and I am attracted to their product mix. I like, too, the fact that uh, Brazilian stocks are trading like garbage. Uh, I'm not the only guy who fears the guy who runs the country. Uh, if you look at Petrobras, despite the earnings that they're kicking out uh, and the uh, opportunities that they uh, that they offer up, particularly in the upstream, I think Brazil is a really, really, really cheap market. What'll get in your way with Vale uh, and perhaps Petrobras uh, would be a recession. I think when you ask me the question about industrial materials, the big industrial materials, with the exception of iron ore, where they're big producers, uh, these industries are suffering from three decades of underinvestment and productive capacity. And almost no matter what we do, particularly in the copper business, uh, we're going to see production shortfalls. We may not see them in the near term in the nickel business because of the incredible uh, new production of nickel that we're seeing in 
Philippines and the Indonesia, in Indonesia, the laterite nickels. Note that those laterite nickels are very energy intensive, which means their costs are going up rapidly. And note too, the en environmental degradation that is occurring both in the Philippines and in Indonesia. My suspicion is that particularly in Indonesia, the environmental degradation, which is being tolerated now around nickel production uh, will be less tolerated in the immediate future, which will uh, slow down the growth in lateritic nickels and increase the nickel price, probably more than you wanted to know. But when I look at Vale, a, a, a fair part of their product suite, uh, I, I think, is moving into a period of undersupply. And I note, too, uh, that while oil, uh, pardon me, iron is not moving into a period of undersupply, that Vale is a large volume, low cost, experienced producer. Uh, they will easily be able to compete, not outcompete, but compete with the Rios and the BHPs and the Fortescues of the world. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I like Vale. It wouldn't surprise me to see it get weaker because I think the political pronouncements out of Brazil in the next 12 months will be disquieting. I think the political reality in Brazil will be disquieting. But I've, as I told you, I've come to think in five-year terms, not one-year terms. Potential for accumulation. Uh, before we wrap it up, is there a copper royalty that you happen to have your eye on? Uh, I get the copper thesis. I don't particularly like any of the companies. Uh, so I start to think to myself, well, maybe I'll feel a little more comfortable if there's a royalty that I should uh, research. Is there a copper-based royalty that uh, Rick has his eye on? There are some lovely copper royalties in various companies. Uh, Ecora has a nice copper royalty. Uh, Altius has a very nice copper royalty on Chapada. Uh, but those copper royalties are relatively inconsequential to the affairs of the entire company, uh, which is to say there isn't any company that's focused enough on copper royalties that I would say it's an attractive copper royalty play. There are a couple of, uh, as I said, Acora and uh, Altius that are very high quality, small royalty companies that have lovely copper royalties in them. Uh, the play is rather how those constituent cash flows impact the overall cash flows of the companies mentioned. Makes sense. Uh, Rick. I just, I just have one, one, uh, one closing Peace. Uh, Rick, um, what's your take on the, obviously, you know, we have geopolitical risks, um, you know, changes in presidencies and such. Um, I'm just thinking about emerging markets. Like I've been looking at quite a few emerging market stocks and I mean, China is being beat down, like just it's, it's gruesome. And so uh, like Gavin, Gavin Newsom, <laughs> but uh, uh, I wanted to see like, uh, are we in an environment where you see like emerging market stocks um, outperforming U.S. stocks at some point or? Um... I, I'm not. Uh, in, the, uh, in the near term, I see the U.S. role as a global hegemon continuing, uh, not because the U.S. is such a great place, but only because it's a relatively great place. When you look at China, you can't look uh, because it's so opaque uh, nobody knows very much about the structure the in, in, internal financial structure of china because it isn't as transparent it isn't liquid as the, as liquid as the united states despite the mistakes we make in the united states these mistakes we make collectively in china the mistakes are made by 10,000 people at the top and I don't think that 10,000 people is a large enough feedback mechanism to govern 1.4 billion people. There are some individual Chinese stocks, which I would love to see fall in price uh, so I could buy more. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking of Zijin, which is a very, very, very well-run mining company. I know the people there personally. It's just not cheap. <laughs> China General Nuclear, a uh, very, very, very well-run company. Uh, I would love to see it fall in price so I could buy more. Uh, but I'm not one to say that although the Chinese stocks have fallen substantially, that I have enough information to analyze the stocks individually, particularly in markets I don't understand. And I think it's also fair to say that there are very few people in the world, including many Chinese, 
who have the ability to analyze the data around the Chinese economy and come to good conclusions. I think it is way, way, way too opaque. There are other countries in the world that probably aren't investable for most people that seem to me to be rapidly recovering economies. Uh, they're little, though. Uh, Namibia, uh, Botswana, perhaps Malawi. Uh, you could argue that those aren't investable countries. Uh, and for many people, I guess that's true. They probably aren't investable for me in the sense that uh, the banking communities and the domestically listed natural resource uh, companies in those economies are, are either non-existent or they're too small for me. But I, uh, I, I would need to be very constrained as a political risk investor, I guess for the simple reason that I regard all jurisdictions uh, as risky. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Rick, uh, would you like to wrap it up by telling us about your portfolio ranking offer, if it still stands, and you're starting a new bank. Uh, so yep. you're a glutton for punishment in retirement, I see. Uh, tell us a little bit about those two topics, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Let's start with the bank just for fun. <clears throat> a group of us in 1998 started a bank on my living room floor, which became Everbank, uh, a branchless bank. Uh, you're your computer, your cell phone was our branch. Uh, we told people that couldn't operate their cell phones or computers that they should bank with Bank of America, not with us. Uh, and it had a happy ending for us, if not for Bank of America. We built that bank from zero to $28 billion in 14 years. Usual thing, you know, worked decades to be an overnight success. And we ended up selling that bank to TIAA Cref in 2014. Uh, TIAA Cref had a million and a half members. So the things that made Everbank unique were not necessary. Uh, to the buyer uh, of Everbank. The consequence of that is that 275,000 customers that we put in place at Everbank <laughs> began looking for a home. And despite my advanced age, uh, I couldn't resist as an entrepreneur giving them. So we're building a new bank uh, called Battle Bank. Uh, again, a branchless bank. Again, a focused bank. We will be in the top quartile of deposit interest payers nationwide, because we'll only have one deposit product, you know, not 15 or 20. Uh, this is a money market account, a high yield money market account. If you run to write a check on your account, God bless. If you don't, that's okay too. We'll offer certificates of deposit in 22 major currencies. So if you want to save outside the dollar, you can do it. <laughs> Importantly, on the lending side, uh, although most of my peers in American banking don't agree, I think gold and silver are wonderful collateral. So our, pri our, our premier uh, new lending product will be uh, loans secured by uh, people's gold and silver portfolios in segregated managed accounts. The name is Battle Bank. Go to battlebank.com. Or for those of you who care about my opinion around natural resources and precious metals, you can go to my website, uh, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource stocks. Please no tech stocks. Please no pot stocks. Please no crypto. I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comments might have value. In the question and comment section uh, on this ranking database, if you care about my bank, simply write in bank. <laughs> we'll send you information about Battle Bank in organization. Really wonderful. I, for one, am on the list. DT, anything to add before we wrap up yet another fascinating discussion? No, 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 nothing else to add. I'll, I'll see you next week, Rick, at the uh, New Orleans Investment Conference. I look forward to seeing any of your listeners who want to come to that conference. I joke that that's the second best uh, investment conference in North America after my own at Boca Raton, Florida. I will concede that for most people, it's easier to have fun after the conference in New Orleans than it is at Boca Raton. I intend, of course, to do both. So. Sounds like a plan. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure hosting you as always. Take care, guys. We'll be back with another episode of the ROI podcast. Until then, stay safe, do your own due diligence, and we'll see you in another episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir.